All right, take it away. Um, I'm delighted to serve as the defense chair uh, for Nick's thesis. Um, and to me that, uh, Derek and I have correspond a little bit about this. That just means that I'm a convener. Um, and I guess I do have a formal role in making sure that y'all are fair to Nick. Um, I'm looking after the graduate school's interests to make sure that uh, everything is above board and that you're neither too easy nor too hard on him, but I'm pretty much just going to fade into the background. Um, I did read the thesis and I enjoyed and appreciated it. Thank you, Nick. Uh, and also the introduction, which I guess is probably going to be more the focus. Um, I'm happy to you know, keep time if that's necessary. I think that probably as in most defenses, uh, the Q&A part will go on for a you know, max 90 minutes. And then we'll ask Nick to step out. That means he'll leave the Zoom meeting. Uh, the deliberation will go forward. And more importantly, the paperwork will be serviced. Um, and then uh, Nick will be welcomed back in. You'll have to probably rejoin your defense. So I don't know. Are you the co-host now, Nick? Are you the, uh, the only host? Or I'm the host. And, and, and Derek and I figured this out yesterday. Good. I'm able to put the four of you in a separate room. And then whenever you're done, you can just pop back into this main room. However y'all want to do it, that's absolutely fine with me. Um, and then, uh, and the only other thing is I think that we are going to go into questioning rounds, but it's going to be in the reverse order of the way that sometimes I have seen it done. So rather than starting with Derek, we will end with Derek and um, I would get the first question if, if I wasn't going to pass. So uh, anybody else have anything else to say by way of getting this thing started? All right, well, I will pass. Uh, that puts it to uh, uh, either David or Jennifer um, to, to, to kick things off, if, if I'm understanding the, the format correct. Uh, well, uh, Nick will do uh, an introduction of sorts. Oh, great. For the... Even better. Yeah, so I have a, uh, just a brief slideshow, and then I was probably going to read uh, a short excerpt, if that's OK with everyone. So um, let me go ahead and share the screen. Okay, can everybody see it? Okay, so the Alice Adam Compendium. Uh, just a quick overview of what the Alice Adam is. Set in a world where dreams can be sold as works of art, the protagonist Poe discovers a dream art of a recurring dream he has been having. The dream is of a beautiful woman, which fills him with feelings of wholeness. If someone else had this exact dream, could that mean she's real? The story follows Poe on the adventure of literally chasing his dream. So with that, I decided to expand. And these are the goals. First of all, I wanted to tell a really great story. Uh, I wanted the story to be very cool and as original as possible. Uh, and then in other words, I also wanted to create a dream work. So what is a dream work? It's essentially when you use and explore and study dreams, and convert them into works of art. So transferring the unconscious into consciousness. And it was developed by Sigmund Freud, but also developed um, in the, in the um, uh, fiction and creative nonfiction spaces as well. Uh, and to go further, I wanted to explore the processes of dreams, aspirations, and achievements as the art. So searching and, and, and striving to achieve your goal was the actual art into unto itself, not unlike um, improv comedy, where improv comedy was created to uh, as a way to to create sketch comedy. Del Close back in the '60s was like, "Well, us practicing and and rehearsing comedy is the art." So I took that kind of concept and figured the process of following my dream of finishing this work was actually part of the work and the, the art itself. I wanted to provide multiple forms of media to encompass all facets of aspiration. Uh, and in this compendium, in this version of it, there's the fictional novel, creative fiction, um, poetry, and then also a, a small amount of visual art, uh, which I have better copies than I was able to take photographs of if you need to see them. I also, I like to create a form of game to be played with the reader 
where if they read the poetry, they find some things that are that are telling of the novel and vice versa with creative fiction and, and et cetera. Uh, and then finally, I wanted to explore philosophically the concept of closure, completeness, and finality. If the, if the art is in the process, well, when is that art ever really gonna be finished? If, the, if, if it's just the process, is the process forever? Uh, these were some inspirations that I had. Uh, film and TV, I'm, Derek knows, I'm obsessed with the television show Lost. It's the greatest show ever made, he'll disagree, and that's fine. Um, the Science of Sleep, directed by Michel Gondry. Uh, this is The Discovery, which was not a good film, by the way, but it had a neat idea where, you know, you were capturing dreams. Very similar to the dream capture devices in my story. Uh, Field of Dreams, where uh, I, I drew inspiration to Field of Dreams because of the, um, the, the, the fate aspect. Um, and if anyone's familiar with that film, uh, Kevin Costner finding James Earl Jones and convincing him to come with him on this ridiculous journey without really any proof except for just believing. And then of course, uh, I'm thinking of ending things by Charlie Kaufman, just the strangeness and um, uh, uh, absurdity of that film and, and the, the relationship between uh, someone not sure if they're in love with the other person or not really sure of their own existence. It's a great film. Uh, and then finally, books and writers. Derek recommended Night Film by Marisha Pessel, which has quickly become one of my favorite novels ever. Um, utilizes a lot of the augmented reality where the book itself could be used as a tool to find further information inside the canon. The Dark Tower by Stephen King uh, is the greatest novel series ever written, in my opinion. Uh, just, and again, Derek will disagree, <laughs> but uh, uh, a lot of The Dark Tower uh, with exploration of physics and, and, and uh, adventure and, and things of that nature was a big inspiration. Ant Kind by Charlie Kaufman, really anything by Charlie Kaufman um, was a big motivator. Pale Fire uh, instilled a lot of that gamesmanship that I spoke about in the introduction. Flannery O'Connor with her um, grotesque writing, uh, the philosophy of Carl Jung, Sigmund Freud, Jean-Paul Sartre, The Stranger was a major influence uh, to this entire process when I was reading it on a plane to Idaho. And the Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows, just to nail down the, the feelings that are indescribable um, with actual tangible words. So that's that. Um, and then I'll, I'll let me read some. I'm sorry if you can hear my dog barking in the bathroom. She's jealous that I'm hanging out with people and she's not. Uh, I'm going to read for just a small while here. I'm trying, I'm going to try not to go more than 10 minutes. So I'm going to set a timer just so I don't take up too much time. Um, instead of reading an entire chapter, which would take a good half hour, I'm just going to read as much as I can from this portion. This is the chapter where, uh, Poe enters the diner in Homedale for the first time to finally make contact with Alice. So chapter 12, the strength. Am I a ghost? I'd easily drift through doors, but I'd be alone. I'd be forgotten, unseen. I'd wander for eternity. No strength to physically move something like a door. If I were a zombie, I could at least break through one. The door to the diner was massive, as if Jupiter itself was between Alice and me. I wondered how I'd been so strong up to this point, enduring terrific pain and anguish to get to this moment, since pulling open Remy's glass door was impossible. My arm was about to rip out of my socket as I struggled mightily to pry it open. The weight of the circumstances was nothing compared to the weight of this door. Were they closed? Impossible. People were eating inside. I balled my fist in anger and readied myself to punch through the glass. When a nice older man wearing a trucker cap pulled the door open from the inside and, helped, and held it open for me, I felt my face turn red. When I just stood there like an idiot, the man said laughing, go on, son, I got you. I don't think anybody saw you. Thanks, I said, but still stood there unmoving. I thought it was pull. Yeah, I know, replied the old man smiling and he walked away. Best dessert in the state, go and treat yourself. He said as he seemingly drifted off into nothingness. My attention then went to Wendell sitting on the bench across the street, shooing me to go inside. I was about to rip open the translucent film between consciousness and the dream world. 
The place was fairly busy, but not packed, with the normal hustle and bustle of folks getting their turkey clubs, midday omelets, and coffees. I walked into the small waiting area next to the sign reading, please seat yourself. I timidly made my way inside, perambulating like I was going through a haunted house alone, waiting for one of the poised citizens sitting at the bar beside me to spook me. However, in this moment, I was the ghost as no one noticed me floating by. No one ran in panic as if I were trying to eat everyone's brains either. I prayed Alice didn't see me first, though she shouldn't have met. That shouldn't have mattered since she wasn't expecting me, right? There was a lump in my throat and a persistent demand of be cool, be cool, repeating in my head. After I slunk into the third booth on the back wall with my head down, nervous and facing the front entrance, I occupied myself with the bundle of ketchup, salt, pepper, hot sauce, and maple syrup. The small packets of grape and orange jelly reminded me of the time I'd pound jello shots. Man, I could have used a drink. The sunlight was so bright shining into the restaurant, I was afraid I'd get sunburned. I tried to discreetly change the angle of the blinds so that the sun wasn't blinding me. A woman walked up to me laughing from the conversation she just concluded with the guests in the booth in front of me. I panicked and immediately took note of the emergency exit to my left, but relaxed a bit when I saw it was not Alice. Hey there, first time here? The woman asked in a chipper voice. It was also an uncomfortably loud voice. I didn't want any attention drawn to me by a loud talker, but I quickly discovered this was how she spoke, considering no one paid any mind. Yes, was all I could say. Here, let me help you, she said, leaning over me and fussing with the blinds to block the shining light on my eyes. That can't be too comfy. She scooched herself into the booth to fuss some more until finally she closed the blinds completely. She needed to stop drawing so much attention to me. Thank you, I said. My pleasure, honey, she yelped. What brings you to town? Where are you from? Ooh, are those flowers for me? You shouldn't have. I'm, I'm just here passing through, I muttered. I'll just have a coffee for now. Well, I can get you a coffee, but I'd be crazy not to let you at least try some of our pies, she offered. She pointed to the rotating pie trays in a glass case next to the milkshake machine and the espresso maker. All I could do was nod nervously in agreement. Okay, then, she continued. Sounds like a plan. A coffee and a slice of apple pie coming right up. I'm Jeannie, by the way, in case you need a holler for me. Jeannie took off and walked to behind the, excuse me. Jeannie took off and walked to behind the diner bar back into the kitchen. I eyed once more the emergency exit, double checking to see if it was a pull or a push and turned back around. And that's when I saw her. She was leaning over the bar, pouring coffee into a man's mug. As she lifted up her torso, she arched it in a way that showed why people study calculus curves and the area within them. She was perfect. She existed kindly, innocently, purely. Her hair, her eyes, her lips, they were all exactly like in my dream. She wore a smile better than a queen wears her crown. How would I ever be able to comprehend anything knowing there was something out there as incomprehensible as her beauty? I instantly wished to marry her, a crazy thought. But when does telling someone they're worth spending eternity with ever not sounding completely crazy? She unexpectedly turned and walked toward the booth near me. And I remembered that I was not a ghost and I was right in her path. I ducked my head down into my hands, but that unfortunately made me more visible. She saw my peekaboo eyes from under my hands and she stopped walking. Then she saw the flowers on the table and she stopped in her tracks, coffee pot in hand, curiously looking at me and the flowers. She peered at me, studying me like an anthropologist, then saw my face. I looked up and met her gaze. Hello, I somehow sputtered amidst total mental frenzy. As she made eye contact with me and heard my voice, she dropped the metal coffee pot. The loud clang woke up the neighboring booths and all the folks in the place stared at us. Coffee spilled out onto the floor and splashed on the lower backs of a couple of booth sitters. Becoming the center of attention was unnerving, but what happened next made me want to bolt through the door regardless of its weight. You, is it really you? Alice whispered. My eyes widened. My lips suddenly felt glued shut. My heart was sucked down into my knees. What are you doing? Were the last words Alice said before her eyes fluttered and her knees buckled. My knees were locked solidly in place containing my heart. A burly flannel wearing man sitting next to us grabbed Alice before she crashed to the floor next to the coffee pot. I think that's a good spot to end there. That's that's all. Thank you. <laughs>
All right, thanks, Nick. Um, uh, Jennifer or David, uh, you have the privilege of, of beginning the questioning. David, do you have a, 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 a choice? Do you want to go first or something? I don't sure. care. Sure, I'll start. Um, <laughs> thank you, Nick. That was a great reading. Very <laughs> exciting. Um, I am. My focus obviously is on um, presentation over writing. So my, my question is primarily about the voices um, because you're writing characters, uh, you know, Poe, Wendell, Alice, Bear, et cetera. Did you, how did you first determine their language? What words they used? Certainly we get more of Poe because he's describing. Um, but then did you filter them through what Albert already knew? Does yeah. that make sense? Yes, it um, does. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so um, when the story was first written, um, there was no Albert. It was just Poe, this miserable, depressing garbage person telling a story that um, I pretty much tapped into every single depressive thought that I've ever had in my entire life and just kind of used it as a bit of therapy to, to write this venting. But as the story progressed and the characters developed a bit more, um, I, that's when I started to realize that they were all different parts of a, of a, of a psyche. They were all um, elements of everybody's personality. Everyone has the depressive side, everyone has the old curmudgeon and everybody has the big bear-like ego. Uh, so I kind of focused on their voices to be um, as accurately depicting of those emotions as possible. So Poe as the main character and as the, the, the first person point of view for most of the story, um, it was a very hard, <clears throat> balancing act to make him come across as uh, highly depressive, PTSD, suicidal, but not be completely annoying and um, obnoxious the whole time. And that was a really difficult uh, 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 task to achieve. So I wanted his voice to change towards the end of the story when he starts to find reasons to not want to die you know he quits smoking cigarettes and 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 he has a slightly better positive outlook on things but he ultimately never does change until the very very end because we find out that he is a part of this albert psyche um wendell uh the the um I've given up, nothing matters, for, for, forget any of this. I'm just gonna be an old man and, and drink myself to death. Uh, again, that was the, 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 same, the same trajectory as, as Poe's voice. Uh, I did also want Wendell, due to his age, to be a little bit more of a wise man to Poe, which is where he gets his old man advice. Uh, and, and, and he thinks that he knows everything that there is to know about everything because, oh, I've been around the block, kid. You, you don't know pain. I've been through pain, that kind of fella. Bear is strictly ego. Bear is just this completely um, bombastic and, and, and loud. Uh, I, I always pictured, you know, I don't know why, but I always pictured like Better Call Saul, you know? like Bob Odenkirk in that kind of role, um, being extremely just the most, he's the guy at the party. He's the guy that, that always needs the attention. He likes playing with people. He likes toying with people. And then Alice is the voice of, um, Alice was a tough voice. Alice was the, the voice that needed to be free will, you know, comfortability, she is complete. She doesn't need anything else to make her life happy. She, she had the terrible upbringing with the abandonment of her father, but she made do and she found her purpose, which was to go with the flow and to have, have no expectations and just be as happy as she possibly can in a, in a, in a, quiet, in a quiet town. And that was the approach that I had to each of those, those voices to really kind of nail down the, the, 
the the pieces of the psyche of Albert's psyche that were damaged uh, in in the murder and also were um, latent in all of us in some regard. Did that answer your question sufficiently? No, that was great. That was great. What do you think Albert's experience? brought to the language that you were using for these characters. Wait, could you say that again? What do you think um, from Albert's experience yep. on, in life, what do you think his, uh, how did his language or his um, use of words influence these people individually? Did you see anything that that they may not have that would be revealed, I guess, as... Well, yeah, so in those interstitial chapters, the italicized chapters, uh, I mean, I purposefully kept the pronouns vague, mm -hmm. uh, but having it done in third person point of view, um, I wanted that purposeful detachment. I, I, I didn't want really, I mean, Albert doesn't exactly have a voice until that last interstitial chapter right. where he encounters his cousin. Um, from all that we knew or, or had to go back and, and maybe reread about Albert was discovered through the dream arts and discovered through um, ultimately what each of the characters wanted in the end. Uh, so each of the characters in order for Albert to become whole, Poe needed to understand what love really was like. And Wendell needed to understand how to be a good dad and how to have a good relationship with, with, with his daughter. And um, you see in those interstitial chapters, the, I don't wanna say that Albert had a perfect life, but he definitely had the life that Poe and Wendell wanted. And the reason they wanted that perfect life was because they were a part of it. They were Albert's brain. And I just wanted through, through those um, like flashbacks, through those, those backstories, the reader could then just kind of assume the type of person that Albert was um, and hopefully empathize or sympathize with him and like him at least a little bit to where when he is killed by his cousin, um, we then realize, oh man, this is the guy that had all those other things happen. What a terrible thing to happen. I needed the murder to be pretty gruesome. I needed the murder to be uh, scary and, and really sad and, and very unprovoked. Uh, and sure enough, it's, it's Phil who had the same sort of negative, unrequited love that Poe had. So the Poe towards Alice was analogous to Phil and Carla. Um, so I needed, I needed with that bullet, that negativity entering the psyche of, of Albert. So I think I'm, I'm digressing a little bit, but no, anyway. No, no, no. <laughs> No, because um, one of the things when you were reading that section and, and certainly this idea of, of clue, not necessarily clues, but details that you don't recognize until later when you had mentioned Poe saying um, about him not being a ghost, you know, then it, it was reflecting in that world of like what words were used and how were they used that sort of. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I found that very interesting. And I, I found that um, just even in that reading for me to, my mind started going again, having not yeah. remembered every detail. I like, I like the dropping of subtle hints and clues. It just adds to that fun. Uh, and it just, it was, it was like a little detective novel in a way. Easter eggs. Yeah, Easter eggs, exactly. Great. And if anyone here knows about the inspirations that I showed in the, in the slideshow, Little Easter eggs like that just make me so giddy. <laughs> Jennifer? 
Okay. Um, thank you, Nick. Listen, um, I too just want to say, you know, this was, I love being a part of this project and, you know, your energy and um, sort of overflowing, I don't know, like excitement and goodwill is um, a really wonderful way to end the semester and the oh, year. <laughs> Um, so just throughout the process every time that I've interacted with you I always smile and uh, that's a lovely thing so all right so I'm going to start with um, I, I was you know I was listening um, with great pleasure to you um, reading from from chapter 12 and I'm um, listening for you know to see to what degree my own the question I'm going to ask you um, conforms to that um, chapter. So I'm I'm focused on words like wandering, floating, passing through. Mm-hmm. I'm also thinking a lot about the word revelation that came up in David's um, disc, you know, uh, discourse with you, um, and I'm putting it in counterpoint with that word striving that you, um, you know, inaugurated. Um, it, you sort of defined the dream work as transferring unconscious to conscious, striving as a work of art, and also the idea of the game. So. You know, there seems to be this kind of Freudian inflected notion of the dream work, you know, that's operating in this context. And uh, I wondered to what degree um, you would be able to think with me about another sort of ghost um, influence that seems to potentially be operating, however, latently, um, to use a Freudian ideology, um, uh, which is the, the medieval Um, dream vision, which you've certainly been exposed to um, in our study (laughs) together of Boethius's Consolation of Philosophy. So, you know, for the sake of just rehearsal, the idea of the romantic dream um, vision is more or less a a kind of um, journey that is um, usually guided by some sort of authority figure, sometimes in the context of important uh, medieval dream visions undermined, though not in Boethius's work. Yeah. Um, and, and the idea of the dream vision is more or less to make it possible to reveal knowledge um, or truth that's not available to human people or to the individuals involved in, in a waking state, right? So, so that the sort of human will um, and drive towards interpretation and con- consequence is sort of quieted down a little bit. Um, in order so that a guide can produce um, a kind of revelation that might be impossible to have otherwise. So I wondered if you would be able to um, think about the the novel that you wrote um, in that context and talk a little bit about the degree to which you think that that um, much older model um, is something you either defy or um, utilize. So um, I think I, I was definitely the, uh, the, the the philosophical musings of Boethius. I mean, you know how how much I worked on that. Uh, that clearly was in the back of my mind, um, at least in in uh, the introductions to each chapter, uh, where Poe is kind of thinking out loud. Um, more more of a of a uh, like a novelistic essay sort of uh, thesis that he would just put out there and then the chapter would then go back and discuss it but as far as the the impetus for him doing that um i i i do find fascinating um the world of 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 you know, spirit guides or or ayahuasca trips, things of that nature. That that uh, some kind of of outside influence affecting the brain to 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 figure out something that you might not know just by living your normal life. Not to say that I do drugs or condone them, but I'm saying I understand why people might. Uh, the other influences to the, the, the dream work. Um, I mean, this idea came to me in a dream. So uh, it, it kind of, all, all the work was, I guess, kind of done for me. 
um, where I was doing dream work before I knew what dream work was. Um, mm -hmm. And I kind of went with it with all the other inspirations that I had, you know, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll bring up Lost again, just because it's very applicable. Um, I don't know if anyone, I don't want to spoil the ending or anything. It shows about 12 years old, but whatever. Uh, you know, they're all living in a sort of limbo afterlife in the final season that if they're not if it, they need to be guided by someone to come together in order to move on. And that was a, a, a major um, kind of clue as to how I wanted to end my book. You know, Desmond and Lost was getting all these people that were on the island together, back together in this limbo so that they can realize what important parts of their life were necessary in order to move on. That's right. the same thing as Bear kind of, uh, in, in a way, um, coordinating the reunion of pieces of Albert's psyche by making sure that Poe and Wendell meet and then making sure that Poe and Wendell go to Homedale, fail to learn their lesson, come back. And then um, I guess that's that's the, the closest to the spirit guide aspect uh, that, 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 I, that I wanted to achieve. Um, Listen, you know, part of my impetus for asking this question is is to try to get a a deeper sense of like how authority is functioning in the in the work, not like spirit guide so much as like, for example, on page six, you you talk about blurring the lines between author and narrator, yeah, between reader and character. So, what I'm trying to um, figure out with you is um, like, what is the status, you know? of authority at the end of the day like are we are we the ones who you know do, do you situate revelation with us since we're detecting and game playing or is there you know what i mean like where do you undermine authority ultimately in this kind of metatextual way or is authority end up getting rearticulated through the context of this like dream work you know I what see, i mean no i see yeah. what you're saying yeah so so poe is completely unreliable um so the the authority uh, is is uh, he he kind of fakes the authority. He think he he's pretending or, or or just unassumingly naive to the entire situation. So while he's unreliable, uh, he doesn't he he doesn't fully understand himself because he's not a whole person. He's not a person. You know, uh, so a lot of that authority is on the reader, and it's up to the reader to to either go along with 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 what Poe says or not. I mean, uh, he's he tries to be as self aware as he can be, but his self awareness is is. there's a lot of holes in it because it's yeah. yeah it's limited because he doesn't he doesn't he doesn't know he doesn't know anything really so um i guess poe is trying to be the authority and 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 he ultimately fails being that authority um, and I, I, I'm seeing a connection now that he fails in his mission yeah. in the same regard, right? because he's just so misguided and so under the wrong idea of how things operate that it, it takes then Alice to, to show him and to prove to him that he has been wrong. So in essence, it's Alice's persona, Alice's ideologies that are the motivating factor that when the readers finished with this book, they can choose to believe what they want as far as a philosophy or as an ideology regarding their belief system. Um, I didn't want to have God be a, be a motivating factor in the book. I wanted the reader to question their own perceptions. Am I answering? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's the answer, right? Like, so you're the ultimate, one of the sort of ultimate quests or goals of the work is to like severely undermine any yeah. authority that we could cleave onto to make meaning of anything, which is itself, you know, um, aligned with the way medieval dream vision has functioned, you know? Um, I mean, one of the most prominent of them is um, one in which the guide is, turns out to be this guy's two-year-old daughter. And he can't, he can't not think of her as a two-year-old and as a woman and as a girl and as his daughter. And so authority is just constantly in conflict and he can't resolve it, you know? And so it perhaps, it reminds me a little bit of what you're doing. Yeah, I think that that's an appropriate, I, I, I believe that's an appropriate uh, comparison. Um, Poe is is a, a son of a bitch. <laughs> he's he's not he's not doing a good job ever in the entire book uh, until the outside influence is 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 affecting him. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you. So, Nick, um, my question is kind of going to follow from that um, pretty closely. Uh, as Jennifer was asking the question about authority, um, I was thinking about uh, what you're saying about first person narration. Uh, I've been reading Dostoevsky and Bakhtin and there's a lot of stuff in Bakhtin about, you know, discourse and dialectic uh, in Dostoevsky's work in particular the reason I'm bringing this up is because often uh, Dostoevsky is credited with at least being one of the popularizers of uh, unreliable first person narration through um, notes from underground. Uh, you and I have talked about the varieties of unreliable narration and, and how one might define it the way that the narrator of the underground man is, is a is unreliable in his uh, inability to finalize himself in the way that he is so incredibly self-aware that um, he knows what he's, he's, he knows his ideology is wrong and he'll call himself out on it and then he'll call himself out on calling himself out and it just, it's a vicious circle. Whereas you have someone like uh, Huckleberry Finn, Twain also being sort of credited as a co-founder of uh, unreliable narration, um, whose naivete or lack of self-awareness is the major factor in his um, unreliability. When narratologists talk about unreliability, they often compare it to the implied, um, they, they compare the first person narrator to the implied author um, and sort of presuppose that the implied author is the locus of authority. Um, what strikes me as interesting in your work is that because the compendium exists, the implied author is not implied, <laughs> uh, not exact, not not in the same way that it had that the author has to be fully um, constructed in the reader's mind. Um, based on cues from the text, you are providing um, external cues about the author through your compendium. So this was a long-winded way to getting at the question. Um, you do say that in your, in your introduction that um, Poe is reliable and even use Terence Murphy's definitions of reliable narrator. Um, you're saying here that he's unreliable I'm not calling you out on that contradiction because, well, I am and I also am not, I'm not surprised by the contradiction um, and in some ways let it stand. But when you think about your work having this compendium and when you think about your own definitions of reliable versus unreliable, um, how do you think the compendium changes a reader's conception of the implied author versus the unreliable narrator. Does that make well, sense? 
Yeah, go ahead. No, I just, does, does the question make sense? <laughs> uh, could you rephrase it real quick? <laughs> yeah, and, and we, as I was saying, you know, we normally have to uh, completely construct the implied author when we're dealing with a first person narration. Right. Um, here, you are providing a depiction of the author through your compendium, through the other elements of the work. How do you think that affects the reading? And uh, our view of Poe as an unreliable narrator. Yeah, so so I think that falls into the into the the what what I, I'm calling the gamesmanship of it all. Um, that you know, Pale Fire was written by Vladimir Nabokov, 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 but it was also written by a fictional character. So, which parts of the compendium are uh, Poe? Which are me? Which are who knows who? Um, and I think that's where the the, the fluidity of reliability kind of comes into play in that. Poe throughout the novel is extremely unreliable, but does have that revelation in the end where he needs to reevaluate uh, all of his actions and thusly earns a reliable uh, badge. Um, in the other parts of the compendium, the nonfiction, the creative nonfiction is spoken from kind of a, 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 an amalgam of, of either characters from the novel or myself. Now, considering that each character in the novel is supposed to represent the everyman psyche, or at least the potential psyche of, of an everyman, I feel like that's okay because I'm an everyman and this is my story. Um, I used my personal life experiences to take this dream, take this aspiration and, and expound on it to a voice that is um, more genuine in the creative nonfiction. It gives away a lot more information and it makes the unreliability of Poe in the novel a bit more apparent. Uh, the poetry does the same thing um, where there are clues in the poetry that would clarify certain aspects of the novel. So I'm not sure if I am answering your question, but that is that is a statement I'm making. <laughs> We're getting there. Um, do you think that your the, the compendium as a whole helps stabilize one's uh, the reader's view of uh, of the implied author or or further destabilizes it um i or want it if you will closure <laughs> yeah I, I i i i want it i don't think no i don't think there's ever going to be the closure that's that's strived for within the work um i'm trying like hell to to figure out whatever form that closure even looks like i don't even know what the closure is supposed to look like um but like i said it, it's it's the process that i'm finding to be the most enjoyable and, and, and the art that is being produced you know uh, i wasn't able to do music or film for the compendium i just didn't have enough time um, but whatever the music could possibly reveal or whatever the, 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 the film could possibly reveal, these are all efforts to, to get closer to that, that, that closure. But it's, it's like, um, what's, what's the, uh, the paradox of the, the race between the, the man and the turtle? And the man is always trying to reach the turtle, but he'll never Zeno's Zeno's paradox. Yep, that's the one. Like there's something like that that's going on here, where the more I do, the more questions there ultimately will be. So I'm never gonna get there. 
Uh, but man, it's fun to find out, right? It's fun to try, which is kind of the whole ending. Like, stop worrying about what the process, well, stop worrying about what the end is going to look like. Just don't ask questions about the universe. Or if you're going to ask them, don't expect an answer. You're not going to get one. You don't deserve one. Uh, so the process of finding it is the art itself. Um, and I think that there's, there's a, a, a there's something cool in that. And I think more people should try to do it. Yeah, I mean, the reason I brought up Dostoevsky and Bakhtin is Bakhtin's argument about Dostoevsky is that his whole project, which is an existentialist project, was to um, relinquish authority uh, as best he could by um, refusing what he called finalization, but it's very similar to closure with any of the characters. The characters don't change. They, they're constantly um, bumming themselves up against competing ideologies uh, and through Dostoevsky's use of polyphonic uh, presentation, which is very similar in some ways to, uh, to what you're doing Yep. not just through juxtaposing Poe with uh, the third person narration, but juxtaposing the whole work with other forms of, uh, of art. So you're taking that polyphonic element and, and expanding it outside of the confines of narrative art. Yeah, which is something that I completely, I, I, I after I submitted the introduction, I realized that um, Kundera does that a lot. The, mm -hmm unbearable lightness of being that that was um you know again more of that that novelistic essay kind of approach where there's the um where the voices kind of all the different voices kind of get together but they're still separate from each other what's next <laughs> I'm working on one, but I'm not sure it's there yet. Uh, it has something to do with the uh, the visual pieces, um, but yeah. uh, I think I probably need another round before I'm ready. Okay. Oh, so that, that would take us back to David, I believe. I'll jump off on that because that's actually one of the things that I wanted to to ask some questions, Nick. You're um, incredibly um, descriptive of the environments that Poe walks through, lives through, experiments, um, and, and a great deal of his observance of those spaces. And I found it very interesting and I had to triple check um, because I wasn't sure if I had created the dream arts in my mind, um, but how you juxtapose that with what I was quickly rushing through you don't really describe the most visual elements of your book to your audience. And I was wondering what, what made you, um, what made you allow real life to be so descriptive, especially in things we understand and the things that we won't understand, you chose to leave to the audience to manufacture maybe. Yeah. Well, because everyone's, I want everyone to have a different view of what those dreams are really going to look like. Absolutely. In fact, uh, there are some of the dream descriptions that uh, Derek in, in his notes would uh, disagree with. You know, for example, Derek, one of Derek's notes, I'm not calling you out, Derek. Uh, one of your notes was, I don't remember ever dreaming of celebrities. So why are we seeing dream arts of celebrities? I personally have dozens of dreams about celebrities. Uh, playing ping pong with Bruce Willis was, a, was one that I remember. Uh, so it, it, it's different for everybody. We, we, there's no, no way that you can accurately describe what everybody's dreams are gonna look like. So that's why I kind of kept it vague. You know, Sometimes you have like a Van Gogh image. Sometimes you'll have a, 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 a Pollock. Sometimes you'll have something concrete like it's actually realistic film um and i wanted to cover all the bases and the style of drawing that i have one right here if you don't mind let me grab this one. Yeah. so the style of the single line drawing mm -hmm. uh and there's no 
proper orientation. You know, if I ever sell this and someone wants to hang it up, they could do it whatever way they want. Um, but it is one through line. These, this is all one line that goes throughout and creates this image. So I found that to be a bit of a metaphor to it's one brain that has one stream of conscious that is creating something um, that's there. And you can see whatever you want to see. The dream arts in the story are, some of them are there for, you know, just merely for allegory or mm -hmm. um, some are there for comedy and others are there for uh, uh, plot uh, uh, progression. So yeah, I did. I don't want them to be nailed down. In fact, I want the the real world that Poe is experiencing to be as concrete as possible. So also that when he gets to Homedale and feels it to be a bit alien and artificial, because it's not real. It's it's a it's it's starting to, to blend in. He's starting to get small hints that the world that he's in is not exactly a concrete world. Um, so yeah, that's, that's that. Okay. And the, it's interesting that you brought up the art too, because, um, it, you know, as a visual artist myself, the understanding of the small line that you're focused on, right. This continuous thread that doesn't itself in its bend and its turn doesn't itself imply anything, but it's when that turn and that movement has expanded that one starts to see. And even when you were talking about that image and the, the different ways that you could look at it, your individual mind, you know, much like a Rorschach test or something like that, wants to read more into it, you know? And so my visualization of what Poe's dream of Alice was um, is probably very different than everybody else's here um, because we could personify it. And there was something that was very interesting and powerful in that, the personification of how we bring to it. I dream of celebrities as well. Uh, I dream of very strange Heidi Klum entrances and things. I don't know why. I don't even know her really. But um, but I think our personification of dreams might uh, might have undermined what you were trying to do with that. Okay. You know. So I think that's I think that's great. I think the the ability for us to personify them and into think we've read something that we didn't read like I was going back why I, I remember the dream being yellow you know and I was like going cool. through it it was like oh there's nothing there I have I have invented this world and yet the 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 specificity of the coffee cup or the 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 weight of the water glass you know those things inform us in different ways that we sort of pass through to, I guess, um, acknowledge the, the reality, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, but there's a lot of work there that I found very interesting overall. Another thing I'd like to add about the visual art aspect uh, with regard to closure, to go back to closure real quick, yeah. is um, when I'm drawing these, I don't know when I'm done. Yeah. I really have to stop, which is most, you know, most artists when they're painting or, or doing anything visual, have trouble knowing exactly when it's finished but here there's it, it's a it's a literal representation of of i'm i'm choosing to stop the line right here the line is done the image is done i could go i have one above my computer over here too and every time i look at it i'm like well what would it look like if i just kind of continued moving um and and i, I never i never will i have uh, it, i'm just gonna i, I it's Anyway. anyway, well, that's the risk of fine art too. Yeah, of course. Right? The risk is, have I invested enough into this? Yeah. To relay the information without necessarily over producing to cloud the, the impetus of it. You know, there's, right. um, 
a great famous line from a play called Six Degrees of Separation, where they're talking about a Kandinsky painting. Um, the whole play is about that, but, but this art dealer mentions something about going to see their children's uh, artwork like at an open house right and and he says the first the kindergartner's work was was all you know primitive and messy and the the third grade work was sort of uh overthought but he looks at the second grade art and says why are these all these second graders geniuses um because of what he sees within them and right. basically the art teacher says i know when to take it away from them i know when they need to stop. They don't wow. know when to do it. So he reacts to the the energy of stopping at exactly the right point. And I think wow. there's something within that drawing that you're mentioning that that continuous line um, that you don't have somebody to stop you. You have to you have to navigate that yourself. You have to say I have finished. Yeah, and that's that's kind of going back to. What we were discussing earlier on on how many pieces of the compendium are going to exist you know when yeah. is, when is this story done and i even mentioned that in the in the creative nonfiction uh piece doneness yeah right? explore like what the hell Who, like wow so um i don't know i i, I feel like it's just always going to be a, a, a fountain for me to sure consistently quench my thirst well and you had referenced um Oh gosh, what's the book? The book about the house that opens up. Uh, Lee, uh, uh, house of Leaves? House of Leaves. I kept wanting to say Leaves of Grass. And of course, with all these- Same you know, thing. English people <laughs> here in front of me, I'm embarrassing myself. But, but yeah. House of Leaves, um, I could never progress past about three quarters of it because so much information was given. Yeah. And I think that's the doneness of it too. Like what is enough information that you don't lose yourself into the rabbit hole right. and lose sight of the story, right? Exactly. And there's a doneness about that too. Cause I, I really appreciated those, the tidbits that sort of um, supported the artwork that supported it. And it didn't distract me from the book, the novel. Right. Um, but it, it, fleshed out or added tonality to what I had just read, as opposed to figuring out this illustration in, you know, House of Leaves that that then leads you to something and then you forget why is the house expanding, you know? So anyway, that's- well, I'm, glad, I'm glad you, 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 I'm glad you appreciated it. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Jennifer. Okay. Um... So I, uh, I'm looking on page 16 of your introduction okay. um, in which you um, make a claim about the risk mm -hmm. of the suspension of disbelief. Uh, you're on page 16, you said? I think it is. That's what I wrote down. Um, is that where I discuss uh, John Crary's book? No. Nabokov at the end of the page, the last paragraph. There is a risk of suspension of disbelief. There we go. There is a risk of suspension of disbelief with the Alice Adam and Pale Fire was a guidepost on how to not allow my story to cancel itself out. Yes. So, you know, being a romanticist, um, my ear is um, very sensitive to the suspension of disbelief because it's Coleridge's term. Um, I, I'm not sure what you mean by that or what the risk is or what canceling itself out is. So I wondered if you would just start by helping me to understand that. And I think I'll follow it up um, potentially. The, the suspension of disbelief just needs to go with the fact that I'm exploring, I'm exploring stuff that's fictional, that's unprovable. Um, uh, if you were to accept my philosophy on, or at least this world's philosophy of an afterlife uh, uh, over acts of hate and acts of love, um, if you buy into that, once you have that groundwork, 
then you're able to um, then you're able to 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 play the game. Um, I didn't want the story to cancel itself out. In 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 other words, I didn't want it to um, like be so uh, 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 contradictory or so um, blatantly crazy that it just loses interest in the reader. Um, I needed to, to tread that line. There's another saying in, in comedy where you can go to crazy town, but you need to take the local stops along the way. You have to earn your right to get to the crazy town. Mm -hmm. So I needed to earn my right to have a world where pieces of our psyche are interacting with each other and need each other for that the host psyche were to go to heaven. I mean, we don't know. Uh, it's a, it's just that it's not as concrete of, I, I haven't read a story like that, that you have to buy into an idea of an, of a, of a whatever else is out there before you can actually just dive into a story. So, I mean, suspension of disbelief is a term that refers to a reader's, um, willingness to suspend judgment of the implausibility of a fictional thing right it's right. it's a it's a willingness to go with um something that seems implausible um yes so i guess i fail to understand what the risk of that is i mean that's something you're attempting to earn oh i see what you're saying um Right, that delicate balance of not losing someone or, or, or pushing them so hard that they feel like it is implausible. I mean, for Coleridge, this was specifically about trying to make something that's um, uh, seemingly supernatural come down, down to earth and be essentially available, right? Mm -hmm. So for him, the, the sort of delicacy is to um, manufacture the fiction in such a way that, um, readers aren't irritated, you know, or just fall out of the, well, I mean, flow, you know, the thing. This might tie into the authorship where I, I believe this and I, 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 I don't know, I, I might've misused the word risk there, but essentially I, I, I want people to buy into the entire idea of the whole thing. I want people to buy into um, all aspects of it and not have one aspect cancel out another one to where I, to where I say something in, in, in one media that kind of negates the other media. I, I, I was hoping that, that they would all mesh together. I see. Right. So it's in, it, it, more or less what you're saying is there's a risk that the reader, the reader will fail to suspend. There's a risk that the reader will not, in lack suspend of a better it. term, get it. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and um, when you're doing that kind of gamesmanship or placing Easter eggs or things like that, mm -hmm. any way you mm -hmm. want to phrase it, there's always that risk where someone is just gonna, it's gonna go way over their head. And I needed it to be simple enough to where your, your average person could still enjoy all aspects of it. Um, you know, Pale Fire, which I reference in that paragraph, the mm -hmm. poem in Pale Fire, on its surface, it's a great poem. It's just a really good poem and it could have been published as a poem on its own. But when you have that risk of adding more information from Kimbote or, or, or uh, any other aspect with, the, with the, the exploration of it, you risk negating the validity of the poem itself as well. So I didn't want one aspect of the compendium to completely negate another aspect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, absorbing that information. It's, um... Uh, 
it, it's interesting to think about this in regards to metafiction, uh, formalism. You know, I would, I don't know that um, Nabokov, I've, I've asked Tatiana, our, our student from Russia, how to pronounce everyone's name. Um, it turns out I can't even pronounce Tolstoy uh, because it requires a, a D-ish T at the beginning that I can't really do. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, but it's Nabokov, uh, although apparently it also depends on your social class, how you, how you pronounce his name. Oh, okay. uh, interestingly enough. So, um, but Kundera falls into the same category as, as, a, as, as a writer who has the sort of formalist approach, uh, metafictional approach, but um, also moves us at the same time. And it's, uh, I'm, I'm constantly fascinated by that in the way that the question of whether you even actually have to suspend your disbelief in any way uh, in order to feel something or if your mind has different um, there's different parts of your mind that uh, that are affected by the work differently um my question has nothing to do with that cool my apologies uh just to kind of a follow-up thought uh the question has to do with um the uh, reveal at the end. I'm really, I'm really fascinated by these sorts of things. I, I am attracted to them, both the ones that work and the ones that um, fail. It's, uh, it's always a big talk about risk. It's always a big risk to do the twist ending, um, as 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 M Night Shyamalan will uh, will attest to. I think. Okay. Um, but one of the things that I think that I've found the ways that people talk about twist endings, if we can call it that for a second, um, that, that I found profoundly wrong is that it replaces the reading that we had um, been assuming all along. Uh, in, in my mind, it, it creates, it doesn't replace at all, it, it creates a secondary reading that talks to the original reading that doesn't go away. Uh, my question for you is, you speak of the, the twist ending, the, the dope reveal, I believe is the uh, term that you use. Um, yeah. It's a clinical which, term. Which may, be, which may be the term that I now uh, use in, instead of twist ending. <laughs> uh, it's dope, but at the same time, um, how you, and you also admit that it wasn't, um, part of your original conception of the novel. So how fundamental is this ending um, to the total meaning of the work to you? Uh, and, and one way to frame an answer to that question is when you think about how this ending creates at least two possible readings of this work and in our thinking about them, we will probably naturally put them in some kind of hierarchy. One is, one is more true than the other. Of course, you can disagree with that if you'd like to. Um, so how fundamental is this ending and where do you see it in the hierarchy of meaning uh, in your, the fact that all of this is happening inside of the dying mind of Albert the um, I should clarify and say that 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 the all of this happening in the mind of someone else, I'm not entirely sure if if that was actually yeah I, I'm, I'm not sure if that was in the beginning iteration of this. Um, but to answer your question, it, it's a justification for the behavior of the characters uh, in the best way that I could think possible in order to promote the moral or the theme. And the way that I always thought of theme is the author of this text believes blank. And whatever blank is, that's the theme of that piece. 
Um, the ideological authority. Sure. I, yeah. I believe that, I, I, all the philosophical stuff that we've been talking about. I mean, I believe that there is no reason to, con to, to concern yourself with uh, what is after. It's all about leading up to the point where you need to go to whatever the after is. So life with, with uh, uh, good morals and good ethics. So I needed a figure that lived his life in those positive morals and ethics and was still given or still attacked with, with such negativity and such hatred that killed him. Um, so while all these negative, terrible things happen because negative and terrible things happen in the world all the time, and there's something that we all need to deal with, how do you deal with it? So I, I wanted this reveal to not remove all of the, um, let me see how I can phrase this. Everything that happens in the story up to that reveal is all just evidence of when life is really hard, when life gets, gets really, really hard, you have to still focus on what matters. And it's, I guess the, 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 it's not so much a twist ending as much as, as a revelation of priority. What is the priority of what we're doing in this story? What's the priority here? We're, we're forgetting what it means to be truly good people. Um, and when presented with the opportunity to redeem themselves, Poe and Wendell make the ultimate sacrifice and um, they're doing it out of the goodness of, of other people, which, which is something that I want readers to, to, to digest, that it's the other person that we need to be worried about. It's the other thing. It's, the, some, it's something outside of us that needs to be um, approached and I'm not sure if I if I answered that question, but I I I think that the the I think that that's the the biggest reason or motivator to have the entire Albert storyline be revealed. It's to show and to prove that everything up to that point. Why, is, is just an example of how hard life can be sometimes for some people and how inexplicable the world can be and how we don't deserve answers or get answers when we want them. So how do we deal with that? Well, let's remember what it's like to be decent humans. Um, I like I like where you're going with that answer. Let me let me push you just a little bit further with it uh, in regards to the the two different readings. And I, I don't want to suggest that they're uh, independent of each other or that they don't create a third reading, um, but just that there are at least two. Uh, in one reading, these are people, fully fleshed out people who have free will and can make choices. In another reading, they are um, aspects uh, of a uh, one individual's personality. Um, and we're disintegrated against anything that we could call free will and to some extent reintegrate, whether it's according to their free will or not, it's just something that is happening psychologically. Um, are these, do these two readings reconcile? Um, or does one cancel out the other? Um, does one enlighten our understanding of the other? I think that's the they, they I think they they improve the understanding 
upon the second reading of what the main message is and um goes back to to the thought that we have no idea what the heck is going to happen if a bullet enters our brain and we die uh i i like to tap into the more concrete science of it as well i, I liked to allude to what we know of science on the quantum level at a micro scale where subatomic particles are behaving in ways that are completely unpredictable. Um, so it's a fictional novel at first, and then it's the second time you read it, it's, it's more or less um, a philosophy paper that's based in physics, you know? Uh, I, I, but you can't have one without the other. And, and um, that's one of the main reasons why I'm so drawn to science itself is because of the, the elegance of it. And the science is, is, is as beautiful and inexplicable as the stuff that's going on on a macro scale in our day-to-day -day relationships with each other. So yes, they need each other. They just like, we all need each other. Um, Derek, if you when you're done, I got, I'm going to take a whack at one, but I'm not trying to yep. uh, cut anything sure. short. Go ahead. Oh, okay. So, um, the, I guess the hook on this question is how does play get to work, or how does the pleasure of the game uh, get to what you call the moral? Um, and I think it starts in my way in is through the the visual, the line drawing which um, I'll just admit uh, for whatever reason looks like testicular tissue to me. <laughs> I'm glad you picked up on that. That's exactly what I was going with. <laughs> this is like when I was a, a first year uh, at college and I, and I told them that uh, um, the jar upon the hill in Tennessee was the Tennessee Valley Authority. That was a, that was another moment. <laughs> I told everybody that I was like, "Hey, I got, I figured it out." But the <laughs> you got you got me googling that right now, and I'm gonna so, close that out. Thank you. Uh, to me, that is the the image. I can't um, besides the te testicles. Um, uh, I can't see that otherwise than as a as wandering right from the kind of a first person right if i was if i was that line and i was just kind of wandering around and around in a, in a really aimless kind of way and to me that's just the it's it's almost like the map of a journey across a territory and it, it and not a purposeful journey but a, a deeply peripatetic <laughs> so to me that's kind of the play that you talk about and that you're inviting your readers to and your viewers um there's this incredible discovery um, that you're asking for and, you know, the hunt for Easter eggs. We were just doing that at my house this weekend. And, and you're absolutely right. You got to hide them just right. You can't, if they, if the kids can't find them at all, it's no fun. It's like, you didn't even do it. Um, but if they're too easy, it's too easy. So there's gotta be a range. Um, so that's the, that's the sort of the play part. Um, but how does it get to work? Um, what's the relationship of this playing that I think, um, you know, maybe people of uh, our generation in this this whole group I'm talking about, you know, have been really invited to play, play in these metafictional ways and this, you know, sometimes conspiratorial ways. I mean, it's like our minds are just being invited to exploration and daydreaming and all these kinds of things. And that I understand is, for me, that's one of the great boons and, and goals of fiction. Um, but how does that in your mind, as, as a writer, as a person who's produced these artworks, how does that get to the moral? What is the experience of play, of curiosity, and all those things? How does that connect to the getting it of when life gets hard, you have to focus on what matters? Yeah. Owen Wendell make the ultimate sacrifice. You know, how do we how do we experience that leap or make that leap? Or how are you trying to make that possible for us? Or yeah, so so. Um, part of the reason why I included the, in, the entire idea of gamesmanship, Easter eggs, whatever you want to call it, uh, is because it's fun and the journey's supposed to be fun. Uh, 
if the journey were a slog or homework, it wouldn't, no one would do it. So uh, I, I, I liked to add the idea of, of the play within it because um, there always needs to be that aspect of play when trying to achieve an aspiration or, you know, or trying to achieve a dream, I should say. So my entire purpose for this compendium is to make it, to do the thing, to get the book on the bookshelf or to get you know the, the music recorded or whatever. Uh, adding, adding a little bit of play in there, just fun, just for fun to make it interesting and make it uh, uh, not boring. That's pretty much, I mean, it's a very simple answer, but that's why I did it. it, it the journey is supposed to be fun. So, okay, well, let me just push you just a little bit since I've opened my mouth. Um, uh, you know, I'm a Dewey guy. Um, yes. And he, he definitely deprecates the model of education or learning or discovery or inquiry where we take something kind of boring and unpalatable and then we sprinkle a little sugar along the top. Yeah. Right. He's like, that's that's a recipe for bad education, bad art, bad politics. But that kind of was the substance of your answer is like, I've got we got this hard thing we want to do, but I also want it to be fun. Um, yeah. Is it, you know, maybe I'm looking for a, a synthesis that's not there, um, but does the fun part lead to the moral um, or, or is it like a little, is it like a, a spoonful of sugar that makes the medicine go down? Well, I mean, I told you that I appreciated all that Dewey has done for public education over the years, but that is one thing I do not agree with him on. Uh, <laughs> as, a, as a middle school teacher, you need as much sugar as you can get. Uh, so uh, there, there's, uh, I, I truly believe, I, I, don't, I don't buy the fact that, I mean, I understand where he's coming from, where his idea of, you need general education in order to finally have um, a full understanding of specific topics. That I completely agree, agree with. And that's also something that I imparted into this compendium. You know, if you don't have a basic understanding of physics, then all that physics talk is going to be completely over your head. So a general education is necessary in order to read this compendium or to experience the compendium. However, uh, in order to sell copies of it, or in order to make it palatable, enjoyable for those people who choose to read it, I, I got to sprinkle that sugar on there. Yeah. I guess I'll go next uh, because it actually bounces off that though, um, Jeremiah, I do want to say you've referenced Mary Poppins twice in this defense and I that was the first I, time. Wait a second. Uh, I don't remember, but it was at the. I think you may have said supercalifragilistic or something, <laughs> something in that. Anyway, talk um, about Easter eggs, huh? <laughs> exactly. No, um, but I think all three of these things kind of brings to an interesting point is um, the use of physics and pose connection. I guess you could say the author's connection that is being informed to us actually makes him somewhat reliable because we see, and, and also in conversation about Freud and, and Jung and such, because those are, that's information that we already understand. If, if he, as a character said, oh, here's what string theory is, but it's actually ping pong balls and they're filled with glitter. All oh, that's the real like, um process of creating um willing suspension of disbelief and i think i understood it in a very different way maybe than jennifer did because we use it sort of it more in the aristotelian method of theatricality you know that we have to set all the the the, the points in motion so that we know where we're going so that we we said oh we got to get this stuff out of the way got it let's get on the train let's go um, but I was really fascinated with if that's how you saw that general education that you sort of needed to pop in there to make him more reliable in a sense, to, to ground the work, to ground his work yeah. um, into 
for lack of a better word, reality, that all of a sudden we don't find out that we're on yeah. in an M. Night Shyamalan way that we're actually all ants in, yeah, right, right. on Mars or something like that. Right. So because of the uh, unpredictability and uh, uncertainty, and I'm using those terms pun intended, with quantum mechanics, um, no one out there can say that this couldn't happen. You know, um, so yeah, there is there there's the reliability of Poe is more on the side of unreliability throughout the story. But as far as the reveal goes, hell yeah, that could happen. You don't know. Um, and I, I I thought it was a, a a fun way to justify that kind of reveal by having scientific theory be the explanation for the events that occur in the book. Uh, well, and there's something too, because we have that three-year blackout for right. him, right? And we don't know very much beforehand. I mean, we get little niblets of Carla and we get niblets of war and things like that. There is a sense that maybe that's going to be compounded on, like we're going to find out that he was actually had gone to college for x y and z and he had started this thing and that's why you know so so it does i think as a character lead some mystery into how he knows this stuff you know in some ways that that make us more make him more appealing to us than just as you were saying a very unlikable yeah right character you know um and then of course it accentuates the turn. We're not going to use the the twist or whatever. Uh, I like that one <laughs> that we didn't like before, but um, but I found that very interesting, and I think I think that resonates kind of through a lot of the things that were being said. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, have we reached the end um, yeah we're at, we're at about the 90 minute mark I yeah yeah i don't know if you have any other questions i don't know i think i'm i'm great i'm all set thank you i'm happy to talk more about quantum physics if you guys want <laughs> <laughs> well on that note let's let's yeah. go to delivery oh uh, you guys are no fun <laughs> uh all right i so um i guess what's going to happen i'll put you guys in the breakout room and then um so I will assign manually. Yes. I have a question for you. Sure. Like what's going to happen with the recording when we're in our room? It's I, I probably think better for him to make somebody else the co-host and him to leave. Yeah, I agree. Is that, is that how it's going to go? Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I, I can just stop the recording if that. I think yeah. it'd be best to stop, stop the recording it here. Too. Okay. Yeah.